Hi, my name is Bobby Harrell. I am the Business Development Manager for Systems for Strand Lighting. And today we are talking about theatrical control concepts. This is a better path toward understanding the thinking of a lighting console. So understanding the underlying concepts of a theatrical control control it's a critical first step to understanding the way a control console thinks. Once this is digested, a world of dramatic opportunity opens up to the lighting team. And it doesn't really matter if we're talking about theater, dance, opera, corporate theater, houses of worship, uh, live events, TV. Uh, the power of lighting can provide emotional gratification that would not otherwise exist. So some of the things that we're going to discuss today are the DMX 512 protocol, uh, terminology, dimmers versus outputs, uh, DMX network, channels versus fixtures, levels versus values, patch, cues, cue lists, groups, subs, effects, uh, presets, and palettes. So several years ago, back in 1986, uh, the DMX standard was ratified and that gave us a unified protocol that for all manufacturers uh, to use and communicate in the work. Prior to that, all the manufacturers had, an, um, had their own proprietary protocol and nobody could talk to each other's equipment. So DMX gives us the unification to do this and some details to understand DMX. First thing that one needs to understand about DMX is that it is a single directional protocol, meaning the console will send the DMX signal to the dimmers, relays, LEDs, moving lights, whatever DMX device it is. And that device cannot respond back. So the console is constantly communicating. And that's the first part of understanding the bandwidth of what DMX is. So it's approximately 40 times a second the console is communicating with the DMX devices. Also, uh, the other two components of what's going down that DMX cable is the quantity. And there are 512 unique device addresses on every DMX cable. And that is that collection of 512 devices is generally called a universe of DMX. So if you're going to go beyond 512, then you're going into a second universe of DMX. The other component about uh, the bandwidth was the resolution. So within each one of those devices, what can you say to it? How many different points of resolution can you have? And uh, zero is zero. So if you're talking to a dimmer, that would the lamp would be out. If you're sending it a, um, a level of DMX 255, then that would be the equivalent of 100% uh, intensity or full. So there are 256 steps, zero through 255, throughout uh, each um, each unique address that you can communicate with. So DMX cable, it is an XLR connector. It is five pin, uh, which is uh, different than audio cable. Audio cable is also an XLR connector, but it's typically three pin. Now it is not recommended to use audio cable when communicating with DMX fixtures. Uh, there is three pin DMX cable that's out there. Uh, it's a little uh, rarer than uh, five pin DMX cable. And while it's true that only three of the wires in, in this five wire cable are used, uh, you've got the first three, which are data plus, data minus, and ground, which are used for DMX. Uh, the other two were always there for an expansion, have never been, never been um, assigned to anything. Uh, they are different cables, right? They have different resistances for the electrical signal. So audio cable is not, uh, is not rated for DMX. It's not recommended to be used. Um, proper DMX cable is always preferred. So understanding how you can connect multiple devices to a control console down one DMX cable they can be daisy chains. So you can always connect multiple fixtures. 
then when you get to the end of the line, it is not, um, it can often be appropriate to put a data terminator on the end of these. What that does is keep uh, the signal clean. Oftentimes you may have an end of a line, end of line situation where the DMX data will come back up the line and that's called reflection where a fixture is now getting data from two directions and it'll be very confused and it may start flashing and um, just behaving very erratically. It's, it's usually a reflection issue. At that point, a terminator is probably needed. Um, some people might ask, why don't you just terminate all lines uh, from the get-go? Because unfortunately, you actually can over-terminate a line. So the way it works is there's there's data that's going down that line and uh, it, it's at a certain strength which allows the data con to continue for the rated 1500 feet of length. But sometimes it's too strong, sometimes it's too weak, and uh, it just doesn't work properly. Uh, more than often this is a problem with older fixtures. Uh, I, I don't see these problems as much with newer fixtures but it is still out there. So again you can daisy chain uh, on one DMX line uh, multiple fixtures. You cannot do any sort of T or star configuration the way you might um, deal with a network. So there is a maximum set of devices that can be on one line of DMX. The spec calls for 32 devices. However, I don't know of a single production electrician that will put that many on the line. It's just not worth the risk of having a problem later on when it can be difficult to get to the equipment. So uh, the spec does allow for 32, but the safe bet is to keep that um, length of fixtures on one DMX line uh, reduced below that maximum amount. DMX addressing. So every device uh, that communicates over DMX needs an address. Uh, some devices may have thumb wheels, they may have screens with buttons. Uh, you may even have a device that has dip switches. I thought we were done with dip switches, but uh, with, uh, with the ability to have uh, LED LED tape, which is you know very small and tiny, uh, I'm seeing more more and more dip switches as the uh, interface for setting that DMX address. So a DMX universe. Again, I mentioned earlier that it's a collection of 512 addresses, and if you go beyond that, then you're going into multiple universes of DMX. So your first universe, the real DMX address, is going to be one through 512. The second universe is going to be 513 to 1024, so on and so forth. What's important to understand is that the device, be the moving light, LED, dimmer rack, relay rack, they only understand one universe of DMX. So they're going to have an address somewhere between 1 through 512 that can be assigned to them. It's the consoles that can understand multiple universes. So it all depends upon where you map them on the console. If you have a fixture that's addressed at one, it's but it's patched into universe three, then the real DMX address is going to be 1025. Luckily, most consoles nowadays allow you to input that as 3.1 or 3 slash 1, uh, which makes it a lot easier to manage. So opto splitters. A DMX opto splitter is a pretty simple device that will take multiple lines of DMX, uh, perhaps a, a line, a daisy chain line coming off of each electric, and allow that to be funneled down to just one cable to go into the console. Consoles generally have a small amount of DMX ports. Some might have two, some might have four. Some of the larger desks may have as many as eight. But if you have multiple lines coming off the electrics and uh, you want to pare that down, an opto splitter is the way to do that. One of the rules is that you need to make sure that all the total number of addresses needed on all of the lines that you plug in do not equal more than 512 because it is going to pare it all down to one universe of DMX. Now just to get you the thinking, there are such things as DMX mergers and instead of uh, what an opto splitter does, which is merging the fixture data down to one control line on one universe, 
a DMX merger actually takes two control signals and merges them to talk to one lighting rig. At that point, they usually have the option of being configured as highest takes precedence or last takes precedence. And that determines how these two, who's in control um, when these two signals are merged, because the lights need to know which to listen to. A very good device to have in your uh, toolkit is a DMX tester. It's a great way to receive DMX, confirm it's working at the fixture or generating DMX in case uh, there's a question about the console, uh, testing DMX cables, some actually allow you to do backup cues, and more recently there are some that actually have RDM capabilities for remote device management um, to change addresses, set modes, and do various things uh, when getting to the fixture is difficult to do. So theatrical lighting networks. Networks began to be used when we got to the point where our lighting systems were outgrowing the amount of universes that the consoles could output over hard DMX. Again, consoles often will have two, four, again, larger desks may have eight, uh, DMX ports, but so many systems nowadays need to communicate to larger systems than what that can accommodate. So the industry figured out how to take a standard office network, just basic TCP IP networking equipment, and convert DMX signal to go to uh, communicate over network cabling, network switches, and these are done with network nodes. Uh, Various manufacturers make them. Uh, we have a whole line of nodes, uh, single port, three port, eight port nodes are our current generation. And this allows you to communicate over cheaper um, or less expensive uh, Cat5 and Cat6 cable, because that's about 10 cents a foot, where uh, DMX cable is about a dollar a foot. Uh, and you can also, where you're limited to one universe down the DMX cable, you can communicate uh, multiple universes down a network cable. Again, pulling from the network world, there are very different uh, IP address routing schemes. Um, I'm just going to go over a couple of them, just essentially to make you aware of them. Um, unicast is means that one device, uh, one control device would be uh, distributing the data to one network node that's out over the network. So it isolates it and it limits the network traffic uh, that's that's on the network, um, which allows it to be much more efficient on bandwidth. Broadcast means that the control device is sending the same information to everybody. So every node is going to get bombarded with all of the data and it's up to the node to, the, to take and decide what it needs. Now this puts a lot more traffic on the network. So you can see there are different ways uh, to communicate with devices um, and different network protocols can use different methods to achieve the distribution of the DMX data over a network. So earlier I mentioned a little bit about RDM or remote device management. So this is a protocol enhancement to uh, the DMX 512 standard that allows for bi-directional communication. So now you can have a console talk to a light and the light can respond back and it can tell you its IP address or its DMX address, um, what type of fixture it is, what mode it's configured to, and in many cases the console can uh, can change that information uh, directly to the light. So it's a very uh, important feature, especially uh, with DMX controlled house lights because they may, uh, during the commissioning of a job, they may already be installed in the ceiling and they may be extremely difficult uh, to access uh, otherwise. So uh, I'm going to take a moment here and take a sidestep and just do a little historical perspective. So this is going back and talking about some of the dimming and control systems that were created um, primarily by Strand um, 
a long time ago. So back in 1936, the Strand Electric Grandmaster, this was the technology at this time was that the control was not separated from the dimmer. So these wheels on the bottom half of these racks were directly controlled to the dimmer. So it's all right there. Um, and you would have a handle and you could take that and, and roll it up across that uh, curve and that would increase the output of that particular dimmer. And you can see in the middle there are all sorts of gears and levers that will allow you different ways to, to co combine uh, certain certain dimmers so that you can move multiple dimmers at the same time because again you were moving the the individual dimmer manually so these took these were big racks they were extremely expensive and it took uh, it often took multiple operators to do for them complex scenes what we would con con consider very very simple nowadays uh, Strand did create uh, a product called the Light Console for about 21 years that was an organ, or it, the interface was designed just like um, just like an organ. So it just it just sort of shows the thought process behind um, communicating with light, and you can see the colored paddles there, which were directly related to the color of uh, the color of the lights so they often had uh, strips over the stage that would have red white blue and green circuits of light and that will allow you to control those different ones so a smaller than the first one but again this is still a direct relatable con um, control system that is controlling the dimmer directly and again you can see some of these Ruth Goldberg like engineering for the uh, for the chains and the wheels to to get multiple things to move uh, collectively so now in the 50s we're actually getting to more preset style control this was actually for a TV studio I believe in Hamburg where and I'm gonna go to the next one because it'll be a better shot if you look at the main panel on the left you'll see um, sort of four main banks before it gets down to the two smaller ones those four main banks uh, have uh, wheels or have sliders over over those wheels and this is one of the first um, one of the early uh, control consoles that was separated from the dimmers so this was all done electronically and this could be in a control booth away from away from the heat and the mechanics of the dimmers but the way this worked is um, those sliders on the top bank would be the entire lighting system so that second bank is going to be a second scene all for the same dimmers so this is this is different than the more mechanical approach that we saw earlier this is more uh, what is called a preset style of operation so with that preset style if you were doing four scenes on this console which you could do you would set all your levels on scene one that that top bank then you would set all your levels on scene two and scene three and scene four and then you had a way to crossfade between between them what's important to understand is that in the preset style operation even if the channel was duplicated from one scene to another, you had to manually set the level because as you were crossfading from one to the other, it took the entire bank out and replaced it with the other bank. So that's a very different way of thinking about light as opposed to tracking. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, later. So again, just sort of a bigger version of the same thing. You might notice the big uh, pin patch panel up at the top left for assigning uh, dimmers to channels and again more of the same preset style operation with banks and banks and banks of these uh, electronic dimmer faders now we're starting to get to a little more portable control this is more more of a desk but again you have the same same approach of uh, preset faders 
So now back to our um, sort of going over some of our terminology. So a dimmer. So that's an electrical device that supplies the electrical output to the incandescent fixture via control signal from the console. Uh, this is the way lighting systems were engineered for a very long time because we were always dealing with incandescent sources. Uh, we also had dimmers that were locally installed. So these are, um, these are raceway dimmers. Uh, the technology is the same. It's just uh, engineered different uh, for a different application. Um, we have moved away from calling these DMX control um, addresses dimmers because we're not just talking the dimmers anymore right we're talking to LEDs we're talking to moving lights uh, and each output is going to control a different parameter or a different attribute of that device so in the past when you had an incandescent fixture it just had one device controlling it and just one address and that was a dimmer now you've got fixtures that um, can take can need dozens of DMX addresses to control all of their parameters. So looking at a basic automated luminaire DMX chart, um, you can see that DMX address one is for the dimmer and your range of uh, DMX values is 0 to 255. However, if you look at two and three, you'll see that this is for the panning of the fixture and it uses two addresses. Well, why would it use two addresses uh, over one? The reason is with using one address, you only have 256 steps of resolution. And when you have a fixture that can pan uh, potentially 540 degrees, that means every step of DMX, it's going to move two degrees, which means if you're throwing that beam of light 30 feet, you're not going to get the resolution you need because it's going to jump over. It could jump over where you need it. So the industry figured out without having to redo DMX how to use two addresses. And the way it works is if you look at the range, it's a really, really high number because the way it works is on the on the low channel or the coarse channel, you can go from DMX zero to DMX one. Now what happens with that high channel or the fine channel is it now has 256 steps of control of resolution within each DMX step on the course channel. So you have 256 steps between 0 and 1 and then the same between 0 and 2. So the total here is not 255 plus 255, it's 255 times 255 and that gives us that 65,535 uh, number. So for the control side, um, the two terms that are most often used are channels or fixtures. Generally, people that come from a theatrical background call the control handle a channel. People that generally come from the live event background have tended to work with moving lights longer, so they tend to control the, call the control handle a fixture. The other difference between these two is uh, there have been consoles, and they're still out there, that have channel numbers for controlling dimmers and they have fixture numbers for controlling moving lights. Now they both have their um, they have separate buckets of numbers meaning you could have on the case of the picture there on the right so the 250 ml it could control 250 dimmer channels and that was 1 through 250 and it would control 30 fixtures and that was fixtures 1 through 30 so you had duplicate numbers so it was essential that you had separation between these terms however the neo as well as most current day consoles just have one bucket of numbers and you can arrange your fixtures any way you want in patch you could have channel 1 be a dimmer channel 2 be a moving light channel 3 be an led um, so there's really there's really ultimate flexibility about it but for the most part the terms channels and fixtures today are completely interchangeable now the other thing about channels and fixtures is um, related to patch and when you're patching um, let's say you're patching dimmers 
it has been typical for a lot of environments to do what is called a one-to-one -one patch and that allows you to match the channel number with the dimmer number and it makes a lot of sense from the electrician's point of view because you can walk on stage look up the electric see the label that says 23 and then call up to whoever's on the board and say you know turn on channel 23 and you know you're going to get output out of the light that's plugged in to dimmer 23 or circuit 23. Nowadays, um, when you're dealing with patch, uh, that is not that one to one patch is not always the most friendly for the design side of things. Let's take the example that I'm showing here where I have some warm front lights and I'm just showing one area, but let's say for this particular theater, I've got nine areas on the plot. So I have nine fixtures from a warm front light position to all of those areas. I also have the same from the other side, which has a cool gel in front of it, and those are my cool fronts. Well, if I am controlling them in the one-to-one -one patch, the numbers may not make a lot of sense because for all my warm front lights, it might be uh, channels 12 and 43 and 22 and 5 and 16, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So patching allows you to customize this so that you get them in a channel or fixture order that is numerical. So this example shows something that is much more designer and programmer oriented where my warm front lights for these nine areas are going to be 1 through 9. My cool fronts are going to be 11 through 19. Side lights are going to be 21 through 29 and 31 through 39 and, and so on and so forth. That way the singles digit always matches the area number and the tens digit tells me what system of light whether it's cool side light warm backlight it tells me it gives me that information so it's a lot easier to manage for example if I know I wanted to turn on all of the lights on area 2 because that's down center then without really thinking about it I know that I need channels 2 and 12 and 22 and 32 and 42 and 52 and so on and so forth. So it's a lot easier from a numbers management point of view but it's less um, it's less oriented toward the electricians and what they need. So it's simply a choice and it depends upon your priority as to which one makes the most sense for your environment. So now that we understand channel and fixture numbering, we're going to talk about levels and values. So intensity levels usually use percentage from 0 to 100. Now if we have a light that's at 50%, you may or may not realize that that's outputting DMX 127 because that's half of the full value of what the DMX channel can do. Um, we generally think of intensities in terms of highest takes precedence so that if you have a set of house lights that are on a submaster but you also have control of them um, in a queue whichever device whether the submaster or the queue is outputting the higher value to those house lights that's what's going to win and that's what HTP means so uh, it's always good to understand um, how this is going to work. Now we're going to talk about parameter values. So most current day consoles are going to try and give you abstract numerical information. They're not going to give you DMX numbers uh, because that often doesn't really mean a lot uh, to the programmer or the designer. If I have, for example, let's just talk about pan and tilt. If I have a light that is uh, pointing straight down that's at its pan and tilt midpoint that's going to be an 8-bit DMX 127 at 16-bit it's going to be uh, what 32,000 and whatever the number is I can't even do it in my head so they've moved to showing you pan and tilt information in degrees because it makes a lot more sense uh, to the operator I can say I want to tilt that light 45 degrees and most people are 
pretty much going to know what that means or or pan at 90 degrees or pan at 180 degrees so it makes a lot more sense so patch again this is where you're going to patch the dimmer or output assignment to the channels of the fixtures this could be for dimmers it could be for relays it could be for leds moving lights i mean there's all different kinds of fixtures out there nowadays in the typical uh, theatrical lighting system a cue. A cue is a lighting state that's played back as a manually triggered timed event. Cues will always have a number and they are always played back in numerical order by default. So these are perfect for scripted environments, uh, plays, musicals, uh, dance pieces, uh, even uh, even bands uh, numbers, right? The uh, musical numbers. Um, because anything you have a script what you can do is set your cue to be whatever you want and then the operator simply just has to hit go uh, in order at the right time in order to play back the cues appropriately to match the action uh, on stage now consoles and neo specifically does provide you with different recording modes so you can choose how you want to record information and what is being recorded. Typically, uh, the default way that most theatrical consoles are going to work, and Neo is no exception, is that it's going to record live or record stage. So what that means is that everything that's going out the DMX hose is going to be captured when you do a record. It's simply snapshotting everything that's going out on stage and that includes levels that are, are channels that are off so um, it's going to capture that but you have different uh, different options you can just record selected information just record active channels just record changed information um, but the standard theatrical way of working is to record live now let's talk for a moment about tracking versus cue only part of the reason i showed you some of those old consoles uh, and dimmer uh, uh, dimmer dimmer banks is that back before you had those preset desks that I was showing you from those TV studios is the way everybody thought about it is if uh, the electrician uh, driving one of those road boards was on uh, had had a sheet that for Q1 said bring up channel one then they take that first handle unlock it and roll it up roll it up to the desired level then as they would go through their cue sheet now they get to q2 q2 has an instruction to take that second handle up to full well the question is what happened to handle number one and the answer is that it didn't change at all so handle one or dimmer one has tracked into and is now part of q2 without the operator doing anything about it if you think about it, that's exactly the way your lighting works at home, right? If you turn on your living room light, um, the lights are on in the living room, and that's Q1. Then if you go into the kitchen and you turn on the lights in the kitchen, it'd be crazy to think your living room lights would turn off automatically. So your, your uh, home works in a tracking manner, just the way theatrical consoles have, have the option of doing. So tracking is a very powerful way of working, but not everybody understands it. Uh, it is typical in a theatrical environment, so that um, the basic premise is that it only these dimmers only change level when you provide them with an instruction to do so. Otherwise, they're going to stay exactly where you put them. And it's very logical and it makes a lot of sense thinking about it that way. But so many people get stuck um, and uh, they get uh, cues that don't look the way they expect them to. So I have found that there are three different kinds of people in the world. People that understand tracking, people that don't understand tracking, and people that think they understand tracking. It's the last set which usually gets in trouble. Um, usually because they don't understand uh, the tracking lighting designer's best tool which is a block cue and a block cue will put an instruction uh, on the cue uh, potentially on everything uh, that is patched um, 
and will keep any tracking data from going into or through that queue. So it is very common to uh, block uh, end of scene and end of act queues and fade the blacks. That way you don't wind up contaminating those fade to black queues with tracking as you go back later in the rehearsal process and edit the cues above those blackouts. For those that are purely uh, comfortable in the queue only world, which will only change the data in the current queue, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. It's a perfectly valid way of working. Um, you just need to make the right choice for the way you think about uh, lighting and writing cues uh, for a production. So a queue list, this is simply a container of queues. Uh, you often have environments that will use multiple queue lists when you want to have uh, a list of queues start st always starting with queue one for each different event. So you may want a queue list per song for a band. You may want a queue list per dance piece for a dance company. Um, there are a lot of different reasons to use multiple queue lists. However, if you are doing a theatrical production, uh, you may only need one queue list, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's there are tons of Broadway shows that only have ever used one queue list, and that's perfectly fine. So it's a great tool when you need it, but it can complicate things for certain users if you use them when you don't really need to. So groups. A, a group is a collection of channels uh, and fixtures at a level. Uh, some desks don't include the level. Um, NEO has actually changed over its development. It used to include all parameter data, but now it only includes intensity. But groups are building blocks to help the designer and programmer program cues. So oftentimes the designer uh, it's sort of referred to you're painting with light. So you're using a bigger brush stroke than just grabbing one fixture at a time. You might be grabbing your entire system of warm front light. And a group would be a perfect tool to collect all of those warm front fixtures into one item. Submasters. A submaster is essentially a group of fixtures that have been assigned to a fader is really all it is. The beauty of submasters is they can manage uh, more live event style productions than queue lists can. So the three things that submasters can do that queues don't is number one, submasters can be played back in any order at any time. Number two, a sub can be, man, uh, can be added at any rate of speed so you're not uh, locked into the time of the queue and the sub can be added at any level. You don't have to take that fader all the way to full. So this gives a lot of operators more flexibility, especially during events where you don't always know the uh, order in which everything will occur. Um, corporate events use submasters a lot. Um, live event busking is going to use submasters a lot. So they're there's a lot of there's a lot of great things that submasters can do for you. Effects effects are lighting states that are played back uh, automatically and are dynamic. Uh, these could be intensity effects like a marquee chase. It could be color effects like LEDs going through a rainbow. It could be movement effects uh, like uh, for moving lights, circles, ballyhoos, can can. It could be um, uh, an, ir a, um, an iris effect or a zoom effect on fixtures. So there's lots of different um, things that you can apply effects to. Uh, they can be as simple as just going state to state to state. They could be profile based effects where you say I want, I want tilt on a moving light to do a sine wave. You can um, there are lots of things that you can do. If This can even go all the way up to uh, pixel mapping and uh, dropping images and or movies over the top of large arrays of LEDs. 
So macros. Macros are single button presses that activate a multi button press command. So macros are great when you have a command that you are going to duplicate and use over and over and over again. Uh, why waste the time typing it in manually every time? It's going to take more time. It um, it it's likely to introduce key key input error error. So build it in a macro, and that way you just hit the button once, and it will do the command um, the same way every time. Uh, palettes. So palettes they are also like groups. They are a building block to help you build your cues. Palettes can be used for position, for color, uh, for beam, for gobos, for uh, zoom, for shutters, um, all these attribute families collected. Uh, basically, it's, it's a stored set of data that's filtered to just certain parameters. So let's just talk for a moment about the position palette. You may have the need for every light in the show at some point during the production to be focused down center on a singer. So that's a classic example where uh, the, the preferred thing to do would be grab all your moving lights, point them all down center, um, store that as a position palette, and you could call it DC down stage, DCS down, uh, down stage center, uh, whatever you want. And now every time you need that, you simply tell the light to access the position palette rather than manually moving it there every time. The other big benefit of palettes is that if you take your light, put it in the palette, record your cue, what your cue now has is the reference to the palette stored in the cue. It actually doesn't have the pan and tilt data. So the beauty of this is if during the tech process the director comes to you and says, uh, you know, we have the performer coming down center a lot and I want the performer to come two feet further downstage to have a better connection with the audience. So instead of going through all 400 cues, all you have to do is grab all of your lights, put them down center, move them downstage, update your palette, and now your cues are automatically updated. So there's a lot of power and uh, time saving uh, that is done by using palettes. Um, different consoles deal with different kinds of palettes different ways. Let's talk about color palettes for a moment. Some consoles will have different types of color palettes where you can say, you know what, I want this to be a specific palette, meaning that it will only apply the data that for the lights at which it has information. So it's, it won't apply it to fixtures that don't have the data. And that can be very limiting sometimes. Some consoles have fixture type palettes where you can say, if I build a color for a VL2600 profile, then it's available for every VL2600 profile. There are others that have, um, again, some of them call them global palettes, some universal, it sort of depends. But those are, if I store color data in one light, then I want it to be able to uh, be available to every fixture even though it might be a different color engine, I want it to figure out what it needs and how to output um, how to output the right color. Now, you're not always going to get perfect solutions that way. So what, what we've done on Neo is create virtual palettes. And all three of these different types of palettes work uh, out of one basic palette. You don't have to worry about managing it. It's just that if it has data for that particular fixture, it will use that. If it doesn't have any data for that fixture, it will first look for other fixtures of the same type. And if they have data, it will use that. Um, and that will ensure you get the same color output. If none of that fixture type have color, then it will look to the first fixture it sees where color color has uh, there's color data for the light and it's going to take RGB data and translate it to CMY if it needs to again it's probably not going to be perfect but it will make an attempt and get you a lot closer than not doing anything at all so in summary it's important to understand how your console thinks and how it works rather than just memorizing keystrokes and rote data 
because each different brand and model of console can store and process data differently and that could lead to unexpected results if you don't understand it. So make sure the logic of the console is understood and if that happens you are likely to have a very successful production and get great enjoyment out of working with your console.